Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. What you're looking at is the result of the work of a passionate engineer by the name of Andrew Zonberg, who set himself up to design a passive transmission line based probe that it would be much cheaper than what's available on the market. So you looked at what, it, what you can buy, and they're usually in the orders of a few thousand, and the performance isn't sometimes even that great. So he wanted to create something that would be open source and which this probe that he has designed in fact is open source and that you can purchase for a considerably lower cost than what's in, on the market. And as you can see, he's gone through quite a few iterations and he sent me a whole bunch of his prototypes and it's amazing how dedicated he is to optimizing the performance of this probe to make it as good as he can. I've been talking to him for quite some time and really impressed with how much he wants to make this thing work. So I have the latest version over here which is version 1.3. But I think we should also talk about what is this passive transmission line probe anyway. So let's talk about probing for just a few minutes here. What is an ideal probe? An ideal probe will have infinite bandwidth, it will not load the circuit you're measuring at all, and it will be perfectly matched to the instrument that you're using. Of course, that's impossible. As a result, there are a variety of probe types, depending on the situation. Some have some advantages and some disadvantages, and of course, cost being one of the main ones. So here's a very high-performance probe. This is a Keysight 25 gigahertz active probe, and this thing, of course, costs a fortune, and it's not even the highest model. But the advantage of a probe like this is that it's active, meaning that the front end can have very high resistance and very low capacitance because it's reconditioned by an integrated circuit that immediately follows. In this case, there's an indium phosphide front end that then amplifies and reconditions and is then matched to 50 ohms. So you're doing impedance transformation because of the integrated circuit and you're also getting gain at the same time. Now there are some disadvantages with a probe like this as well. It has limited dynamic range because there is an IC in the front so the nonlinearity of the front end is added to the whatever you're measuring in your circuit. But of course at the same time you get very good f flat frequency response, very high bandwidth and these things are invaluable in high speed surges measurements especially on uh, PCBs and so on. At the same time, you can get passive probes. Now, passive probes are quite common, uh, most common being, let's say, a 1 mega ohm times 10 probe that you see uh, used with oscilloscopes. Now, even though that's a 1 mega ohm probe, it has also a big capacitance associated with it, usually maybe 5 or 10 picofarad. And that capacitance, therefore, rapidly degrades the input impedance of the probe as a function of frequency, meaning that as you go higher and higher in frequency, you will get attenuation, the gain will change, the group delay will change, and more importantly, the loading of the circuit you're measuring will also change. You don't want any of that. So perhaps a different type of probe construction would be better. So therefore, another type of probing is these transmission line-based probes. Now these transmission line probes are really very simple in principle, but not so simple to design in practice. They're based on the idea that if you make a very good transmission line, you have essentially a constant impedance, 50 ohms. There are no reactive components, it just looks like a 50 ohm resistor. That is of course not true, eventually as the frequency goes higher and higher, other effects come into play, and eventually the transmission line also falls apart. So on this transmission line here, you can see there's a coplanar waveguide here in the middle with ground on both sides. The solder mask is removed so that you can have air dielectric at the top. And on one side, you have an SMA. So looking in here, you will see a 50 ohm transmission line. Now on the other end is the end where you want to put under your device under test. And you want this to be as high as possible. So what you do is you put a resistor, a high performance, low capacitance, low parasitic capacitance resistor in series with your transmission line. At that point, that resistor, let's say, can be 500 ohms. It's therefore be connected to a 50 ohm line, and then you will get an attenuation, a factor of 10. But then that attenuation also means that you get an impedance transformation from 500 ohms to 50 ohms, pure passively, pure resistively, and you don't need to do anything else. The ground here, you can see one very close by, and on the ground further apart, which you can then connect in different situations, of course, and they will all have different frequency responses. So Andrew has done quite a lot of simulations on this and has improved this design over time because the transition between this ground signal probe tip to a coplanar waveguide through the resistor and ultimately to an SMA all has to be electromagnetically modeled and simulated, which he has done in Sonnet, in order to get the performance to be as good as possible. And that's many of the changes between the different versions are quite subtle. You have to look very carefully to see that. There also needs to be sometimes some filtering embedded into the line in order to cut out higher frequency orders so you don't get weird peaking in the response of your probe. And sometimes you may even want to absorb the response of the cable directly into the probe itself to get as flat of a frequency response as possible.
If you get a very good flat frequency response, you also get good rise and fall time. You have good group delay, which maintains the, the pulses on the rise and fall time and doesn't cause any dispersion and a lot of other advantages. Let's do a very quick impedance measurement here at DC. I'm going to measure the resistance between the transmission line and the tip of the signal probe here. We should see about 450. There we go. Perfect. That makes sense. One other thing to keep in mind that a transmission line probe like this presents itself at DC with a 500 ohm resistance because there's 450 here and 50 in the instrument. So it's not very good for circuits that have a high DC potential because you will have to dissipate that through the tiny, tiny little resistor here. And that's the difficult part because this resistor needs to be so small in order to have high performance and low parasitics, it will not be able to dissipate a lot of energy and therefore can be easily damaged. Something to keep in mind when you're using a probe like this. So a good way to measure this probe is with a multi-channel network analyzer. So here we have an Agilent E5071C. This is a four-port network analyzer up to 8.5 gigahertz. And we're using channel 1, 2, and 3. The reason this is useful is because not only can we measure the probe's response, the actual transmission through the probe, but we can also measure the influence of the probe on whatever trace it is we are putting it on. And that means that we can look at multiple things at the same time. So for instance here, what I'm doing is that I'm passing a signal from channel 1 to channel 2, so we can measure the S parameters, S21 and S12, and all the other different aspects of this trace itself. This is a coplanar waveguide line running across this PCB, and it's exposed. So we can probe it along this line. As soon as we put the probe down, it's going to, of course, affect this line. It's going to affect the transmission through it, the loss through it, the matching. But we also see the response through the probe using the third channel of the, of the network analyzer. So I can simply pick this up, look at this probe, look at the, all the parameters at the same time on the network analyzer, and get a good idea of the performance of these probes. So I'm going to try the old one and the new one, and we can compare the two of them. So let's go ahead and look at the screen. Unfortunately, my video capture isn't working, so I can't capture this because of this weird resolution it's using, but I'm going to try my best and capture the screen for you. Let me also mention a few other things. The calibration plane of this setup is at the edge of these connectors. So what we're seeing is the response of the line itself and the response of the probe itself. All the cables are obviously de-embedded from the S-parameter calibration routine itself. This gives us a very good setup because it isolates everything into exactly the part we want to look at. When you're measuring, let's say, an eye diagram or something which we will do next, you won't have the luxury of having a measurement plane de-embedded. You can, it's just not as easy. So just keep that in mind when you look at the measurement here. So here are all the measurements we're making. Let me describe that very quickly here. At the top left, we have S21. This is on a 1 dB per division. S21 is the response of the coplanar transmission line from connector to connector. You can see it has a very flat response. It has about half a dB of loss at 4 gigahertz. That's to be expected because this transmission line was designed to operate at fairly high frequencies. It looks quite good. At the bottom, we have S11 on the Smith chart. And you can see it's well matched. This is the return loss looking into one of the ports of the transmission line. On the other side, you have the network analyzer, so it's quite well matched. In the center of the Smith chart, it just gives you an idea of the response as it changes when we land the probe on it. At the top right, we have S31. That's the actual response through the probe. Right now, it's sitting well below minus 60 dB because the probe is just sitting on the table. Of course, there is no response there. And at the bottom, we have the group delay of S31. This shows you how much the group delay varies across frequency once we land the probe. This is very useful when you want to understand broadband response, especially when you have some kind of a strange response through the probe. This would give us some hint on what, let's say, an eye diagram would look like through a probe like this. So I'll talk about the tip of the probe and the landing quality and so on at the end, but let me try and see if I can land this here somewhere in the middle of the transmission line. Let's see. Here's the... Let me see if I can get a good land. There it is. There you go. That looks nice. So on the top left, you can see that as soon as I land the probe, we have a huge drop at around 2 gigahertz down to 7 dB. This is the loading effect of the probe on the line. And it's quite heavy. must have a large capacitive component to it. And that's disturbing the line. This may or may not matter in your simulation, in your measurement. But of course, this is uh, going to be a problem if you want to have the line that you're measuring simultaneously operate exactly like it used to have. Now, this is the first version of the probe. So we have to try the other one too. At the top right, you can see the response of the probe. It's a nice low-pass response. It has about uh, 2, 3 dB of drop, around 2 gigahertz. Yeah, I guess about 2, 2 2.5 gigahertz of bandwidth. It's a nice low-pass response. doesn't have any weird ripples or peaking or spikes anywhere on it. And at the bottom, you can see the group delay is fairly flat. It means that this probe will be able to capture nice eye diagrams. It has a fairly good response. Let me lift that up. Let me, let me let's say, land closer to one of the connectors. Let's see if that makes any difference. 
There you go. You can see that the response of S21 didn't change very much, and S31 didn't change. It means that it's a well-behaved impedance, even though it is causing quite a bit of a drop on S21. Let me go all the way to the other end of the line. Measure again. Yep, very similar response, not much of a difference. So that is the older probe. Let's go ahead and lift this and try changing the probe to the, old, to the new one. So I'm just going to remove that. I'm going to try and get a similar landing here. Let's see what we have. Let me see. Wow, look at that. This is a significant improvement. Look at the response of S21. Yes, the probe is still has an influence, but it's so much less than before. The response, it remains fairly flat still. Yeah, it does cut out at higher frequencies, but it doesn't have that ugly notch it did at around 2 gigahertz. And look at the response of S31. It's so much more broadband. It does have a bit of a drop at the beginning. It does have some peaking at around 5 gigahertz. But wow, this is a huge improvement. So whatever he did at the front of the probe, the modification he made on the transition has had a really positive effect. You can see the group delay is still very good. And it's so much more broadband. In fact, it's much more broadband than the 8.5 gigahertz network analyzer that I have here. You would have to measure it with something else to see its full bandwidth. But yeah, it's really good. I'm especially happy about the fact that it doesn't destroy the S21 response nearly as much as the original probe did. And I'm sure he can make further improvements to it. So let's land somewhere else, a little bit closer. There you go. Yep, very similar. It's good. It's good. It's very good. So now I'm eager to try some eye diagrams on this and see what we can get from it. Let me see. I can land somewhere else again. I'm just moving around. Uh, this transmission line. I have to talk about the landing quality here in the end, a little bit at the end. There we go. Yeah, looks good. Well, now that we have an idea of how it performs uh, from a spectrum point of view, or I should say from a net network analyzer point of view, let's go and try it with some actual broadband signals. And here is our setup for our broadband measurement. We have essentially the same thing except using eye diagrams. Here we have a data stream coming in into the coplanar waveguide, and on the other side we're capturing it using this sampling head module. The sampling heads have almost 70 gigahertz of bandwidth, therefore anything we see is the limitation of the line and the cables and nothing from the sampling head itself. At the same time, we're using the other sampling head with a cable connected to our probe which means that we can compare the eye diagram captured here to the eye diagram captured here. And the difference between them is obviously from the interfaces. In order to generate data, we're going to use the N4901B over here. This is going to allow us to generate data all the way up to 13 gigabit per second, but mostly we're going to stick it around 3.125 gigabit per second for the lower bandwidth probe. And on the left side here, we have a DCAX, where the two channels we can observe at the same time. Here's the channel one, that's the through the transmission line and the other channel through the probe. Keep in mind that these are on vastly different vertical scaling. This is an 100 millivolt per division, this is an 10 millivolt per division because of a factor of 10 loss in the probe itself. The fuzziness of this line that you see is because of the integrated noise of the front end. The front end has so much bandwidth and I just wanted to make sure that it's not limiting the bandwidth of the system. That's why I'm using it. Just keep in mind that some of that is from the probe itself. So now we can go ahead and enable the data and see what kind of eye diagrams we can get through the probe. So let's capture some eye diagrams. The top eye diagram is at 3.125 gigabit per second. That's through the channel. It does have some ripple, but that's actually coming from the BERT itself. It's not from the, the setup. And the bottom channel is the probe. So let's see if I can get a good landing on this. And let's take a look at the quality of the eye. So you should have a, have a look at the top eye diagram as well, because that's going to show the loading effect. Can get a good landing here. There it is. That's a good landing. Yeah, looks not bad. You can see the 3.125 gigabit per second eye at the bottom captured fairly well. The top eye diagram, you can see how much is affected. And that's what we saw that in the S parameters as well, that the loading does change the response quite a bit and causes that little notch in the middle of the band down to 4 or 5 dB. And that's exactly what you're seeing on the eye diagram. If I remove it, it of course goes back to normal. We can go to lower data rates as well. We can look at one gigabyte. There we go. You can see now the eye has really sharp rise and, eye, rise and fall times and the scale here. Let's capture that. There it is. You can see even has an effect at one gigabit per second. And that's normal because you are really hurting the frequency response of the channel. Let's go back to 3.125 one more time. It's 3.125 again. Let's look a little bit more zoomed in here. 
Let me land somewhere else on the line. There we go. So it's definitely usable and it does have some effect, but yeah, you can definitely use it. Let's go ahead and try the higher bandwidth probe here and see what happens in that case because it does have quite a lot more bandwidth, so we should see more open eye. But at the same time, it does have that peaking, which could cause a bit of an issue. So here we go, 3.125 gigabit per second, second probe. Good landing. There it is. Yes, you can see that the eye at the top is barely affected. Here's with the probe. Here's without the probe. It's much, much better. The loading on the line is considerably improved. And at the bottom, the eye does have a bit of a ripple in the middle. That's because of that peaking. That peaking response is, is going to cause that ripple in the transmission. It's hard to get a good landing, especially with the camera in the way. Yeah, not bad. So if you could make that response more flat, it would have a huge improvement on the quality of the eye. And I'm sure that's something that he's working on. Let's increase the data rate here. Let's go to 6.25. There you go, much higher data rate. Let's land over here. There you go, you see now it looks better because the eye is half the size and so that ripple doesn't line up uh, where it used to be and the response is more suitable for a broadband eye of this throughput here. And the top eye doesn't really seem affected that much. Yeah, overall I have to say it's it's good. It's definitely usable, I'm, I'm obviously put it in a very difficult setup, especially with the extreme high bandwidth of the sampling heads. One of the advantages of a probe that has a lot of bandwidth like this is that you can partially compensate the cable. I don't have that here. So you're really seeing every bit of peaking in the response of the eye. So this is a tough test for this probe. May not be entirely fair, depending on how you intend to use it. But uh, yeah, I have to say really impressed for something of the simplicity and the cost that he's trying to put out. Very nice. And here is the eye diagram at 6.125 gigabit per second, where the top plot is the through and the one captured through the probe. I have to say it's pretty good. I can definitely use this in, in my future setup. So let's talk a little bit about these pins. Now generally I'm happy with them. They have no movement, so these are not pogo pin styles and there's a reason for that they may not have a good frequency response or they may be quite a, more, quite a bit more expensive if you want them at higher frequencies but the problem is that when you have no movement it's difficult to judge if both of these pins have landed on the traces and this is very susceptible to any movement this probe can have so maybe investigating to see if something like that is possible and might be worthwhile the other thing is that the casing of this probe these pins come out of course the casing is connected to the PCB in some places in a very, very small footprint. And that means it's susceptible to breaking, especially if it falls off the table and there's no movement, so you can just snap off the, the casing itself. Now, a lot of probes will break if you drop them, of course, so that may not necessarily be a disadvantage of this probe. But maybe having a sl small cutout in the PCB and having this embedded deeper into it to have more coverage of the solder and hold it in place would be good. But all of this EM simulation will have to be redone as soon as you do something like that. You can also see that if one of the differences between these two probes is that this is much smaller and this already tells you there's a quite a bit of a difference between the capacitive footprint of this compared to the other one just by its dimensions. So overall, yeah, I think they work fairly well. Some minor improvements on the landing ability of these pins I think would go a long way. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this quick review of these probe. I'm happy with them. It's definitely going to show up in the future videos in various places. The broadband response can indeed be improved a little bit, maybe a bit more flat so that it doesn't have so much of a peaking, maybe even optimize further with the probe itself. Uh, I'm sure that he's working on it and it's going to get better and better. I will leave all the information on how to get one of these probes or how to pre-order one in the video description so you can jump on that and take advantage of it. He's a, a very, very dedicated to make these things work, which I'm happy to see. And if you like it, let me know in the comment section and I'm sure we can have a nice discussion.